As people from all over the world pour into the U.S. at record rates, there are concerns that transcend standard political opinions. Law, order, and morality have been the guiding forces in the past. However, the mere volume of migrants in the last few years has led to an unprecedented discourse on both sides of the aisle. In particular, the recent decisions made in the state of Texas have introduced questions about sovereignty, as well as the power the federal government holds over the country as a whole. To get to the bottom of the story, we have to look at how the United States has traditionally managed similar cases, as this forms the basis for modern policies. Additionally, we need to investigate some key factors. Who is crossing? How this became such a significant crisis? And what American leadership is doing to solve such a complex problem? For starters, the U.S. is what analysts would refer to as a settler state, a governing body produced by colonists. Other countries that fall under this description would be Canada, Australia, and South Africa. But there are those who believe more deserve to be on this list. Regardless, this is one of the main characteristics that makes the United States different from countries like Egypt or France. It's a country whose very existence was originally dependent on the steady flow of migrants to create profitable settlements. Some have estimated that as many as 34 million settled in the states between 1820 and 1920. By 1891, the country had a population that felt generationally tied to the budding republic, and the federal government created its first office of immigration connected to the treasury. By 1906, lawmakers voted to reform the nation's pathway to citizenship, and the Bureau of Immigration added oversight of naturalization to its responsibilities. At this point, the U.S. had created a national identity, and many people looked to their representatives to form a more bureaucratic approach to citizenship. An ongoing theme of immigration is escape, usually from oppression or resource scarcity. The outbreak of the Russo-Japanese War in 1904 forced many Jews to leave Europe to avoid conscription into the army. New York's Evening Post wrote in 1905 that Russia, while denying her Jewish subjects all civil rights, does not object to sending them to Manchuria to stop Japanese bullets. These many reasons propelled Jewish people to seek refuge in a new country. Before that, it was the Irish escaping the Great Famine, a ten-year period where a quarter of the country's population fled to the U.S. in search of fertile land. Policies were put in place to accept these people, who were often escorted to areas of the country that needed rural growth or industrial labor. The antebellum period showed the first real signs of widespread resistance to immigration. Most of those foreigners came from Germany, Ireland, England, Canada, and France. Welfare burdens and religious differences pushed nativists to form their own organizations to slow the rate of acceptance. It also spawned the American Party, also known as the Know Nothings, in the 1850s. Among its nativist policies, the party's central goal was to increase the residency period for naturalization to 21 years. In the wake of the Civil War, Republicans came out in droves to discredit the movement. President Abraham Lincoln stated, Our immigrants are one of the principal replenishing streams which are appointed by Providence to repair the ravages of internal war and its waste of national strength and wealth. As a result, the U.S. passed one of its most significant pieces of legislation, the Homestead Act, allowing eligible immigrants to earn citizenship in return for developing land for five years. This was groundbreaking but many representatives debated if this should apply to all migrant workers, as many considered the influx of Chinese labor to be a problem in Western territories. This is where we began witnessing states taking the law into their own hands. The Chinese Exclusion Act emulated previous California legislation that attempted to impose blanket bans on immigrants from China. Although the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 only imposed a 10-year ban on Chinese laborers, Congress extended the ban through to 1943. It should be noted that this was a biracial effort supported by both black and Irish residents in San Francisco who felt that unfiltered immigration would jeopardize their opportunity for consistent work. This would end up being one of the major decisions to set a lasting precedent, where much of the future policies advocated for limiting immigration, judging each new wave of immigrants on more of a case-by-case -case basis in order to appease the middle class. During the Great Depression and World War II, few immigrants wanted to come to the United States illegally, and the program allowed some of those who might have otherwise come illegally to enter on a visa instead. This would quickly change when the war ended, with the INS recording an increase unlike anyone had seen in decades. The Bracero Program, a Mexican labor system that welcomed the entry of 50,000 to 80,000 Mexican laborers, came to an end. The U.S. found themselves juggling frantically, arresting hundreds of thousands of Mexican immigrants, only to bring them right back in with temporary work visas. The Bracero program was active until 1964, when labor unions finally succeeded in bringing it to an end. This would spark the fire 
that's now one of the world's largest underground immigration economies. Border crossings would slow down until the 1990s. Following the boom, the immigrant population was 19.8 million, accounting for 7.9% of the U.S. population. This would trigger the modern response we see in place to this very day. According to available data, legislation was partially responsible for the change in origin regions, but much of that shift was due to economic development globally. Whereas Europe and Canada were wealthy regions relative to the rest of the world, developing nations were wealthy enough that their citizens could emigrate, but not yet wealthy enough to entice them to stay. At the start of the 21st century, George W. Bush expanded legal immigration and legalization in the hopes that this move would appeal to Hispanic voters. It was a tactic that won him support in Texas, but it was at odds with representatives like Californian Governor Pete Wilson. After 9-11, the Patriot Act would strip many of those rights afforded to immigrants via the expansion of deportation powers. This was then followed by the congressionally approved Homeland Security Act which moved many federal agencies that were responsible for immigration enforcement under the department's purview and restructured them as Customs and Border Protection, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and Citizenship and Immigration Services. Policies created by the Obama and Trump administrations would continue to encourage the deportation of illegal immigrants leading into 2019. However, changes in the labor market, federal border policy, and global unrest have since reversed those moves in a pretty significant way. In a statement from 2021 by the Border Patrol, 1,659,206 encounters with illegal immigrants and other border crossers along the southwest land border were reported, which grew to 2,206,436 in 2022 and 2,045,838 in 2023. Footage has been released in the past few months illustrating that the United States has recently been crippled suggesting that the country has become incapable of managing border security. Just recently, independent reporters have been pointing out that this is no longer a Mexican movement per se. In fact, Mexico is simply serving as the gateway for a variety of different incoming demographics. When we speak about authorized immigration to the U.S., 2.6 million people, nearly the population of Chicago, legally immigrated to the U.S. in 2022. This exceeded the number of new entries in any year from 2018 to 2021. As far as temporary workers and students are concerned, Mexicans were the largest share of immigrants coming for work at 39%, while, quote, Indians were the largest share coming to be with a family at 24%. However, in light of this year's revelations, the backgrounds of illegal immigrants coming from Mexico tend to vary wildly. The cause of this appears to be the lack of migratory restrictions in South America. With rising public unrest, European countries have started to clamp down on their once liberal acceptance of African immigrants and refugees. This decision has prompted many to flee the continent to find safe haven in the United States instead, a shift that started to smother law enforcement in southern states connected to Mexico. Government reports indicate that the number of Africans apprehended at the southern border jumped to 58,462 in the fiscal year 2023, from 13,406 in 2022. The top African countries in 2023 were Mauritania at 15,263, Senegal at 13,526, and Angola and Guinea, which each had more than 4,000. In order to temporarily anchor themselves in the processing states, many of these African refugees are claiming asylum, a claim that takes advantage of the slow-moving U.S. response to such cases. Originally, a lack of security in South America was something that sat at the bottom of the political agenda, but now it serves as a global migratory vein leading into the heart of the U.S. Many start their journey by crossing the Darien Gap, a swampy jungle that takes dozens of lives with every mass crossing. Migrants then continue through Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico until they arrive at the southern U.S. border. Most made stops along the way, working with stone and piling charcoal to afford each subsequent leg of the difficult journey. In a two-month analysis, it was discovered that 28,000 African migrants passed through Honduras, a six-fold increase over the corresponding period in 2022, according to the Honduran government. Guinea, Senegal, and Mauritania were among the top 10 countries of those migrants. Many are quick to point out that this route was somewhat of a mystery to non-natives, a trail not worth exploring due to unpredictable climate. And yet, over the course of just a few years, this path has evolved into a sophisticated network praised for being the only reliable way to the states in one piece. This, in conjunction with increasing resistance in Western Europe, has angered groups that feel economically and socially attacked. 
The most active as of late has been the state of Texas, with the focus on the current influx making the government body start to take the law into its own hands. In a rather controversial stream conducted by tech billionaire Elon Musk, the public figure visited the Eagle Pass border crossing in 2023. He spoke to people like Tony Gonzalez, a local congressman for the district, and Sheriff Randy Brown to get a quote unfiltered perspective on the ongoing battle for border safety. The two made the case to Musk that Biden has created an open border policy where illegal immigrants can enter freely after unsatisfactory processing. Many of those migrants have been filmed crossing into Medina County on top of train cars. Tony Gonzalez told Musk that 11,000 people cross the border illegally every day, continuing to clarify that this only accounts for those that are captured, as many areas of the Texas border remain unmonitored due to a lack of resources. Historically, Texas has always made efforts to stand at a distance from most other states in the Union. The state's opinion regarding issues both foreign and domestic has contrasted greatly with many of its neighbors. Perhaps their most notable acts of rebellion, however, have been against the federal government. Addressing the border crisis, the government website has made this statement on the front page. President Biden's reckless open border policies have created an ongoing crisis at our southern border as record levels of illegal immigrants and deadly drugs pour into Texas. Footage can be found documenting Texas's strides toward autonomy, with border regulators making daily improvements to the barbed wire fencing separating major hubs from the constant waves of incoming migrants and refugees. As tensions rose between state enforcement and the feds, Texas Governor Greg Abbott began pushing the latter away from the border wall, a decision the opposition believes to be unconstitutional and even treasonous. Whatever the case, Abbott took it one step further, launching Operation Lone Star, deploying the Texas National Guard and Texas Department of Public Safety to the southern border. Critics make the argument that Supreme Court rulings have made abundantly clear federal power supersedes the state when addressing illegal immigration. But Abbott cites two elements he thinks render those invalid. The first one has to do with problems that follow the presence of National Border Patrol agents. According to some officials, their presence draws attention to the openings in the dividing line, guiding migrants to a safe crossing point. The second is more of a blanket critique of the federal border regulation, claiming that the increase in immigration proves that enforcement is failing, thus giving Texas no choice but to intervene. It's a tricky situation no matter how one decides to view it. Texas and Mexico share 1,254 miles of common border and are joined by 28 international bridges and border crossings. This is almost twice the length of all other bordering states combined. The official record indicates that California falls victim to the most crossings, but such a stretch of land makes it more difficult for Texas to make accurate estimates. As things continue to escalate, the citizenry and their representatives have been stating their opinions. The data shows that 76% of Republicans say the belief that U.S. immigration policies will make it easy to stay in the country once they arrive is a major factor in worsening this problem. About half as many Democrats, 39%, say the same. At the moment, most Americans view this as a top priority, but the disagreement seems to be in the language used to define the current state of affairs. While only 22% of Democrats would call the situation a crisis, the number soars when the migrant issue is reframed as a major problem or a minor problem. Suddenly, 70% are inclined to pay attention. When both party loyalists are asked if illegal immigration leads to more crime, research shows 57% of U.S. citizens agree. Now, when it comes to how the public views government negligence, the views become even more bipartisan than anything previously mentioned. Just 18% say the U.S. government is doing a good job dealing with a large number of migrants at the border, while 80% say it's doing a bad job including 45% who say it's doing a very bad job. The current administration has presented a number of proposals that deal with the rising volume of migrants and refugees, however a vast majority don't seem to think that these have been adequate. That said, people do seem to agree on a few solutions not yet outlined in the recent months. For example, a 60% majority of Americans say that increasing the number of immigration judges and staff in order to make decisions on asylum more quickly would make the situation better. Only 11% say that it would make things worse, while 14% think it would not make much difference. Put simply, everyone seems to believe that this is a concern that needs to be dealt with quickly, but a bipartisan agreement regarding how this should be done is far out of reach. Take sanitation as another example. Most Democrats believe this would be a good step forward, creating environments that are healthy and hospitable for immigrants. Conservatives argue that this will only result in the creation of slums that burden locals and the taxpayer. 
People on the right are in favor of expanding the border wall to prevent entry, but previous political messaging has made this a polarizing belief. Today, 72% of Republicans say substantially expanding the wall along the U.S. border with Mexico would make the situation better. Just 15% of Democrats concur, with most saying either it would not make much of a difference or it would make things worse. As a conservative state, both presently and historically, Texas has gone ahead and encouraged the former, believing that these measures would ensure better long-term resistance against the mounting crisis, one that leadership does not hesitate to call an invasion. Regardless of whether or not one better aligns with one opinion or the other, the conflict has undoubtedly ballooned between the federal government and Texas, to the point where both groups desire absolute victory. The bold moves Texas has made against the federal government were initially met with passive remarks from the Biden administration, as there did not seem to be a great desire to create a mountain out of a molehill. But Abbott's continual criticism has garnered the attention that Washington can't seem to ignore. As soon as the federal government pushed back on Abbott's refusal to collaborate, many states began to take a formal stance supporting Texas sovereignty. As of today, 14 states, including Arkansas, Florida, Iowa, Idaho, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming have stepped up to support Texas's efforts and deployed personnel and resources to secure the border in President Biden's absence. The movement is yet another attempt to reduce federal influence over state law. This is, of course, a response to Abbott's enforcement of policies bypassing federal authority over immigrants crossing the state border. Amidst the chaos, the federal government has sued the state of Texas in an attempt to stall any attempts Texas is making to handle detention and deportation independently. The Justice Department alerted the Supreme Court of Texas's actions in Eagle Pass as part of a case over a lower court ruling that barred Border Patrol from removing the razor wire the state has placed along some sections of the U.S. southern border. The Justice Department is asking the High Court to suspend that ruling saying it prevents Border Patrol from processing and rescuing migrants already on U.S. soil. Additionally, the federal government cited a 2012 Supreme Court ruling on an Arizona law that would have allowed police to arrest people for federal immigration violations, often referred to by opponents as the Show Me Your Papers bill. Both President Biden and former President Trump have since visited the Texas border as the election season begins to heat up. While making the visit to Brownsville, Biden made this statement. Instead of playing politics with the issue, why don't we just get together and get it done? It's a sentiment that few took seriously for the most part, though, given the fact that his visit was political in nature. Trump's visit, as he is attempting to be re-elected, took a firm stance on mass deportation. He has come out referencing policies promoted by the Eisenhower administration, which sent immigrants back to Mexico en masse. Both candidates have come under fire, as those arguments have presented equally controversial goals in the eyes of many American voters. In a viral interview on 60 Minutes, a reporter asked Governor Abbott how he believes the crisis will end. Abbott responded by saying, Oh, it ends very simply, and it ends with a President of the United States who will actually fulfill his oath of office and enforce the laws of the United States of America, and that means denying illegal entry into our country. According to the same outlet, the governor has allocated about $11 billion to Operation Lone Star in the last three years. The percentage of people crossing the borderlines to Abbott's credit dropped significantly, while it has jumped in other border states. Critics say this has more to do with immigration crackdowns in parts of Mexico, but there doesn't seem to be current data that supports that theory. That aside, there are more than 11 ongoing lawsuits between Texas and the federal government related to immigration law, with more undoubtedly on the way. If one were to make a prediction as to how this will pan out, it would probably be an even split. As it has been made clear, Texas is no stranger when it comes to butting heads with Washington, and many of those disputes will probably be tossed around in the court system for years to come. In the meantime, Texas shows no signs of slowing down funding, and domestic support is at an all-time high. On the government's website, U.S. citizens have donated more than $55 million to Operation Lone Star, and this number is projected to rise as long as the media gives attention to the ongoing battle. Now check out why China is terrified of the U.S. Air Force or watch this video instead.